Well, good morning. Morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church here in Rolla. I'm Lou Ellen Hartley. I'm the pastor here. And we welcome all of you who have joined us for worship. I understand that yesterday our planned outside work day got a little wet. Is that is that right? And we did it. You did it. Postponed till 1.30. Oh, okay. Oh, well, okay then. So thank you to everyone who came and did that. Um, I know that it's, it's an ongoing process. It never ends. But thank you to all of you who came uh, to participate in that. As we worship this morning, I remind you to please keep your masks on, even as we're singing, and to sing twice as loud because you are singing behind a mask. This Sunday is the first Sunday that we have started collecting items for Russell House. The Outreach Committee is asking us to bring items, hygiene items, and a variety of other things, and that went out in the... Um, in, a, in an email, if you didn't get it, you can call the church office to see what's on the list. We'll also be sending it out in the church newsletter. But generally speaking, if you remember during Lent, in non-pandemic years, we have, um, we have done a basket of hope where we've collected hygiene items each week and, uh, or a variety of different items and given them to different entities here in town. And so since we're on our way to Pentecost, we, didn't, we weren't able to meet together during Lent, but we will during Pentecost, so we will collect those items and make sure that they get to Russell House uh, to the people who need them. So thank you in advance for your generosity. You are always go so far and uh, above and beyond what we anticipate. So thank you in advance for, for your offerings for that cause. Let's prepare our hearts to worship God. This morning you will be hearing the ancient story of the, um, the Good Shepherd, and we'll be hearing Psalm 23. The Good Shepherd is one of the most ancient symbols in Christianity of our faith. Long before people wore the cross, long before the cross was featured in uh, worship areas, the, um, the Good Shepherd was uh, found as a statue or painted on the walls of known ancient worship sites. It recalls to us who God is in our lives and who Christ is as the good shepherd who cares for us, his sheep. So let's prepare our hearts to worship God.
Please join me in the call to worship. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Let us worship God, and let's pray. We are your people gathered, O God, the sheep of your pasture, the flock you have gathered. Lead us beside still waters, teach us the way of righteousness, and feed us at your table. Through Jesus Christ, our Good Shepherd. Amen. I invite you to stand if you are able as we sing our opening hymn. with ourselves, our hearts will condemn us. But God, who knows everything, is greater than our hearts. And God's deep desire for us is mercy, love, and peace. Therefore, let's confess our sins. We'll confess first together the sins of humanity, and then we will pray silently and confess our personal sins. Let's pray. Lord, have mercy on us. We talk about love, but our actions betray us. We talk about love, but we neglect the poor. We talk about love, but we fail to love one another. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us and abide in us by the power of your Spirit, so that our lives may show our love for Jesus Christ, in whose body we live, and in whose name we pray. Amen. We seek God's grace with boldness, because we trust in Jesus Christ, the one who loves us and laid down his life for us. This is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
As we pause for a time of intercessory prayer, I would like to draw your attention to some of the requests on the prayer list. Uh, we received word yesterday on the prayer chain that Bob May is going to have surgery this week, or tomorrow, as a matter of fact, on his knee. He's going to have that replaced. And Carleen is also going to have to have a biopsy on her liver. And so she, they are asking for prayers. There are sons, I think, are tag-teaming. Um, trying to stay with them and, and uh, looking after them, but let's keep them in our prayers. And also, we keep in our prayers our country as we are facing, it seems, every day. There is a shooting of some kind, there is violence, there is unrest, and of course, there are those who are um, charged with looking after us and going every day into that danger. And so we keep our first responders, police officers, uh, EMTs, P, uh, the, the paramedics and, um, and firefighters in our prayers as they have um, a responsibility unlike no other. So let's pause for a time of prayer and then I will lead us. And when you hear me say the words, God of goodness and mercy, I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Let's pray first silently, and then I'll lead us. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before you knowing that you are indeed our good shepherd. You watch over us, you take care of us, even when we tend to go our own way and find trouble, even when we're not looking for it. We are grateful that in those times you continue to look after us, and we pray that in your mercy you will continue to do that, that you will continue to bring us back home when we're lost, and that you will watch over us as we try to go, do your good work from the home that you have provided. God of goodness and mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this world, this beautiful world that you have created. We pray that you will help us to be good stewards of this beautiful creation so that as we look at it, we are reminded of you and that for generations to come, your children will have the same opportunity to look at this natural beauty that surrounds us and see that there is a creator with an eye for color and beauty and intricacy and interrelatedness. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh, gracious God, we pray for those who are weighing heavy on our hearts, the people we love and the people we care about. We pray for those who are in the hospital facing surgery and those who are ill from COVID. We continue to keep in our prayers those in our church family who are on our prayer list and who are facing difficult times. We pray, gracious God, that you will watch over them and bring healing mercies, but you will also remind us to reach out and bring whatever healing our, your grace through us can bring. God of goodness and mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our community, for our state, our nation, and this world. We pray that as tensions and uh, racial violence and prejudice and social injustice, as people raise these calls and bring this to the forefront of our attention, that a violent response or a violent way of being will be set aside. We pray, O oh gracious God, that in peace we can come together and make a better way. We pray for those who have been hurt and who are downtrodden and who face and live with injustice. We pray for those who impart 
this injustice and who shored up to keep others down. God of goodness and mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the first responders whose job it is to look after us in difficult situations, who protect us, who put out the fires, who come to our aid in our most desperate times. Keep them all safe. Help them as they help us. Protect them. Give them a spirit of goodness and give them a spirit of mercy. Give them an opportunity to reach for peace. And as they face sometimes life-threatening situations, that there will be peaceful ways out for them and the people whom they face. O oh God of goodness and mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who aren't with us today. We pray for the day whenever we can meet together as one community and not fear the pandemic. We pray for those who grieve, those who are alone, and those who are in need of your grace. O oh God of goodness and mercy, hear our prayer. And now, O oh gracious God, as you have heard our silent prayers, as their spoken prayers, we pray that you hear us pray together with one voice, as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to remain seated as we sing our second hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us.
Our epistle this lesson, uh, lesson this morning comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive, him, receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. All who obey this command, his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. Shepherd makes me love. 
Our gospel lesson this morning come from, comes from John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down for my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Positive reputations can be very difficult to build. And negative ones can be very difficult to shake. When I worked in camping ministry, we often lived week to week in that, you know, we would get a group of kids in and they would be so excited and ready to go. And it might be our eighth week of camp and we are exhausted. But someone would always say, remember, it takes years and years to build a good program, and it takes one bad experience to bring the whole thing down. One bad day at camp, and an individual or a whole congregation may never come back. And that was sadly the truth. But one of the ways that Jesus tries to combat that reality in the church is to tell us to love one another as he loves us. If we want to avoid a bad reputation, if we want to live out of the positive, if we don't want to have to work five times as hard to uh, stand in, with honor or integrity in front of our neighbors and to have them judge us negatively, then we want to lead with love. Jesus says, love each other. Love each other. This is my commandment that you love one another. Love each other when it's difficult. And when it gets difficult to love each other, work at it. Don't give up. Work together to make peace, to forgive and uplift each other. And not only love each other, but love other people. Even those you are prone to hate. You got to love them. Jesus says you got to love them as I've loved them. And that's the real rub, isn't it? It's one thing to say, oh yeah, I can love them and still in our hearts have that great disdain. Jesus, in his love, could see past so much, could see with those eyes of grace and accept people as they came to him, injured, broken, imperfect, all of it. Jesus didn't tell the Gentiles to become Jewish in order to receive a miracle. He didn't tell the Samaritan woman to become Jewish when she sat at the well with him. People were invited to follow. They were invi also invited to stay behind and rebuild their lives in the blessings that Jesus had given them. People received what Jesus had to offer, even when it seemed that they were so undeserving according to the general social standards of the time. And really, that's why so many early Christians were poor or from the lower rungs of the social order. They found in the church a love and acceptance that they didn't feel in the greater society. 
They found acceptance and respect in the church where they were all one in Christ Jesus. But of course, we who are here, we say that we are loving Jesus and we have received the love of Christ. But we also know that this message can be counterintuitive to all the social norms, to love when it's difficult, to love those who are unlovable, and to lead with that and to work hard to be a loving community. It doesn't seem like we do that much anymore. To love someone just as they're presented to us seems counterintuitive because, let's be honest, we want to fix people. I'm sure that we all at one time or another have wanted to fix someone we've met. If they would just do this, their lives would be fine and they would be okay and then I could have them, I could be around them and it would be easier for me to be around them or to accept them. If only they would, dot, dot, dot. We want to fix them. We want to make them acceptable to ourselves, but that doesn't mean that necessarily what we're doing in those moments is making them is acceptable to Jesus. We're trying to make them acceptable, but what we're doing really isn't loving them the way Jesus commanded us to love them. Historically, the church has really struggled with this idea that we don't have to make someone else just like us in order to love them in the name of Christ. Nor do we have to make them just like ourselves in order for God to love them. We have struggled with this and our reputations have suffered. There have been so many tragedies in our world which could have been avoided if the church had only led with love instead of greed or power or prejudice. Instead of demonstrating Christ's love at work within us, the church has often demonstrated our own sinfulness on small and grand scales. Wars, wars were fought when church and state joined forces bef before and after the Reformation. German Lutherans and their princes fought Catholic, Catholic Germans and their princes over land and power in what is now Germany. English Protestants fought English Catholics. Puritans executed an English king. <sighs> Armed with the belief that God was on our side and therefore made us superior, led to militaries and missionaries joining forces to conquer the world. I have lived in places where we are reminded that it has only been a couple of generations ago that we stopped sending Native American children to missionaries, boarding schools. That was the practice for decades and decades, that in the name of assimilation and saving souls, missionaries took children away from their families and put them in boarding schools where they cut the children's hair and beat them if they spoke their languages and taught them the doctrines of Christianity and tried to make them forget their own religion and society, all in the name of Jesus and assimilation. So as you can imagine, it can make it very difficult for any form of the gospel to be heard or any love shown in Christ's name to be trusted in places around Indian reservations where the memories are still fresh of this kind of treatment. As people in our society 
have no experience with Christianity except what they read in a history book or except what they may see as reported on television or read in the newspapers, they may have a good reason to say that Christianity may be a little hypocritical, that we say we're a religion of love and yet we seem to struggle to lead with it. History is indeed a story of our struggles and sadly our failures at loving as Christ has commanded us to love. Don't you feel good about yourselves at this moment? <laughs> well, that is a truth in our history. That is true, that it is true, that there are times when whenever we, what we have done has tainted our mission and ministry in the world. But that's not the only part of our story. The problem is that reputation gets recorded in textbooks because it's overwhelming and affects so many people. But what often does not get recorded and remembered is the love that is shared on a daily basis by individuals who carry the love of Christ out into the world in which we live. People of faith have quietly and calmly and determinedly over the centuries continued to love each other as Christ has loved us. And they have continued to reach out to people who need that love we do fight at times to love those that our society says is unlovable. We fight to lift them up and say they are indeed children of God. And we do this because Christ commanded us to do it. We do this because we know that this is what Christ would have us to do. We need to keep sharing the fact that we experience love in the family of God. We know we are loved and forgiven. We know that we have been blessed with a relationship with God, that we get to know who God is and how to live in a way that brings hope and life, not pain and suffering. We know what it is to be accepted and welcomed into the church as we are and what it is to be transformed by God's spirit at work within us as we grow in our faith, as we obey Christ's command to love, we can repair the damage that's been done in Jesus' name and we glorify God. If the reputation out there is that the church is obsolete, then we are here to say it is not. Because it is alive, as Christ is alive. And we do this in ways that sometimes can get us into trouble. Loving as Christ commanded us means that sometimes we need to love people that others would just as soon forget existed. As an example, recently I saw a story about a church in Florida that is open 24 hours a day. They never lock their doors, they never close their doors, and the city has cited them for having a homeless shelter without a permit. Now, the church doesn't provide beds, but it doesn't stop people from coming in and sleeping on the pews or having a bedroll that they unroll and find a corner to sleep in. The church does happen to have showers. It does happen to serve three meals a day, but their doors are just open and anyone can be served. There's a moment that is I found online about this story where, where the... Um, 
The city council has spoken about the fact that they don't want the home, uh, a homeless shelter in their town, near businesses, near homes, near schools, near churches, near, um, well, just about anything. Which means they would much rather not have a homeless shelter. And one actually said, we just need to get them out of here. Bust them away. And pretend they don't exist. As the person comes to serve this notice to the pastor of the church, she says, you do realize that churches are considered to be nonprofits because we do the work of charity in communities where the government doesn't do it. So we provide a service, this meal service and these showers and things like that. I mean, it's what we're supposed to do. It's why we are a nonprofit. And besides that, the church is, you know, it's a religious sort of thing that we, we love other people. That's, it's kind of, that's our religion, you know. And the man says, that's not my business. I'm not here to talk to you about that. I'm just here to tell you, you can't have a homeless shelter. And she says, well, I just want you to know that there are 80 tents in the shopping cart on my Amazon account. And I'm going to go buy them. And I'm going to put them up in our churchyard on our private property. And you just created a tent city in this lovely little town because of your attitude towards these folks. You won't let us have a homeless shelter. You won't let us sleep, let them sleep inside. We'll give them tents on our property. Nothing you can do. And by the way, we'll continue to stay open 24 hours and provide showers and shelter for anyone who comes looking for it. That made the news. That was a big, bold statement. That church, that faith community, that pastor, they're making a big difference in the lives of people in need in their community. A couple of weeks ago, I had one of those moments. I was in my office and I very literally had my purse in my hands and the keys ready to leave the church building to go to the mission to cook lunch. And in came this woman who was struggling to make it from her car under the portico into the front door. And I knew at that moment that I was going to be late at the, to the mission. She came in. She was very agitated. She was very upset. And she was a senior adult who needed some care. So I put everything down, went back into my office, and sat and talked with her for about 45 minutes. She'd been driving around for about 30 minutes having an anxiety attack. She went over the list of things in her life that were causing her great anxiety. Health problems, family problems, all sorts of things. And she drove by our church a couple of times before she pulled in. And then she said, but I stopped here because several years ago, you all were so nice to me at Christmas time. You brought my son and I such a lovely basket of food and such nice gifts. And I just felt like I would be loved if I walked in here. Well, once I recovered from that, I spoke with her for a while and I was able to make some phone calls with her to get her um, the help that she was needing. And, uh, and she was able to go home and, and, and she, was gonna, she was gonna be okay. Sometimes we don't realize the impact of caring in this world, of leading with love, of giving to strangers that we may never meet that people need just to know that they are loved and cared for and that they matter in this world. 
doesn't make the news. It doesn't do away with the reputation that often makes the news or the history books. But as the people of Christ continue to love each other and to love others who are often ignored or overlooked, we do miraculous, sacred work. And we obey the commands that Christ gave us. Because this is what changes the world through the lives that are impacted through love and care. And while it may seem cliche that love can change the world, we know that it's not. Because Christ the Good Shepherd laid down his life for us out of love for God and creation. And so what we do in turn is to love. Lay down our own misgivings and put the love that we have received to good work. Even if it's just filling a basket with hygiene items for women and their children who have escaped abusive situations, they may never meet us, but what they receive is a gift that says you matter and there's a way out. And the way out is through the strength of God's love, alive within us and in the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to remain seated, seated as we affirm our faith together. The Confession of 1967 um, is, was surprisingly written in 1967. It is a confession which speaks a great deal about the need for a community of faith within this world, the community of Christ that helps us live and build um, God's kingdom here on earth. And so this excerpt today answers in part what we believe. New life in Christ takes shape in a community in which people know that God loves and accepts them in spite of what they are. They therefore accept themselves and love others, knowing that no one has any ground on which to stand except God's grace. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing hymn. Let's stand and sing.
read it. Just a reminder, as we close the service, we will be having fellowship outside. And um, where is it today? To the left. It's to the left. We're trying to keep you on your toes. <laughs> to the center, to the right, to the left. It's on the left today as you go out. Um, and you are welcome to, to, to linger and to have some snacks and, and fellowship time out there. Please remember that the ushers will come and dismiss, dismiss you by row. In the name of the Good Shepherd, my family and my friends in Christ, love one another. And may the goodness and mercy of God follow you all the days of your life. And at your life's end, may you dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah and amen. amen.